Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here this morning. Really appreciate you being here for our Bible study. We are looking at Matthew chapter 4. We're down to the last few verses, verses 23 through 25. And uh, before we get started here this morning, if you will, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you and praise you for all your blessings. We thank you for everything you've given us, Father. We we ask, Father, that you would forgive us for any sin we may have committed, whether it be of omission or something that we have done that was incorrect uh, through our human failing and, stu and stubbornness sometimes that we do. We ask for your forgiveness, Father. We, Father, we ask that you would lead and guide us in this study, Father. Help us in our lives to take your word and learn what you want us to know and put that into practice, Father, in our lives and help us to draw closer to you and closer to our Savior, as we follow him down that narrow path, Father, help us to understand that it can be a difficult path, but it is well worthwhile, and <coughs> remind us of that great reward that we get at the end, Father. We get to be with you in that great city, and we, we love you and thank you and praise you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. That's Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So Jesus was teaching in the synagogues. I think we mentioned that last week about the synagogues. They're like we would consider our local congregation or our local church building, right? Just a just a building, but he also preached or <laughs> proclaimed. The word is really he proclaimed the gospel. He proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So, what else did he do while he was proclaiming this? He healed, he healed right? He healed those who needed healing and freed those that were under demonic influence or possession. Now. We want to look at all the people that were coming to him because of this, because of his fame. Who were the people who lived in Syria? If you, just in general, who lived in Syria? Arabs. Arabs. Yes, ma'am. Gentiles as opposed to Jews. Gentiles as opposed to Jews. Mainly Gentiles. Not saying there were no Jews, but mainly, I mean, probably by a large percentage, Primarily Gentiles. Same would be true today. Most of these people were not Jewish, but Jesus' fame did spread to them, and they were bringing people out, and he was healing them. Now, what can we learn from the fact that Jesus could heal all these people? He was no respecter of persons. Well, he was no respecter of persons. That's a good thing to notice, isn't it? Um, Kim and Pat. Right, he's proclaiming the good news, which was for everyone, right, Pat? He had the power of God, right? He is the Son of God, the Messiah. He's showing that, right? And looking at the same thing, I had a separate question. What about casting out demons? What does that tell us? He has power over Satan and the demons. He is definitely from God, Eileen. Yes. I have a, I have trouble understanding <clears throat> the demon possessed. Like they actually could tell that that person is full of the devil. I mean, we feel like evil is encompassed by a person's actions today. Right. So we don't call them evil possessed. We and those. I mean, I don't know of a person that we, is is demon possessed today. 
Right. I don't know of demon possession today. In that, back then, before Jesus had died and rose again and broke the power of Satan, Satan had more power than he does now. So, and I think these demons at that time could possess people because that's what we're told. I don't see that today either. I see people that get obsessed. They, they think about the wrong things and they get obsessed with those things. But we do have serial killers and some crazy things. I, can I, can I totally say that they're not under the influence of Satan and, and evil? No, I definitely would say they are under that influence. Would that count as possession? I, I'm not sure that I would count that as possession I just like they read had. An article in Gospel Minutes yes. uh, that said the demon possession left was done away with when Christ was. Right. And that's what I believe. When Jesus broke that power, demon possession was done away with, just like uh, later on, the uh, the gifts of the Spirit and all that went away as well. But that was for different reasons. Yes, Matt? So similar to that, I think it's also true if we look at the Old Testament. I don't think there's any, any occasions of demon possession that I can recall. It's something that sort of came on the scene for Jesus to demonstrate his power. And I, and I wonder that it's that passage in Revelation where the demons are released for a while, or I'm, I'm really right. falling short on what that passage is, but I, I wonder if that might be part of it as well. Right. Could it be part of that where, um, well, I'm not sure if I can sort of paraphrase all that appropriately, but nonetheless, uh, the, the thought that, you know, maybe back in that time, we in the Old Testament, we don't really see demon possession per se. But we do see it in the New Testament, and it's almost like Satan is rallying to fight against the Lord, and that also allows him to show his power over these things, right? Did you have something, Kim? Uh, man has free choice. And if he chooses to sin and be evil, like being a serial killer, <laughs> that's his choice. That is a choice. That choice, and God is not preventing him from doing that. Right. God will not prevent us from... I really believe Jesus restored us to the point to where it really is our choice. We're not really possessed in the way that they could be back then. I really believe that Jesus restored us to that. Yes, Pat? Back in the time of uh, King Saul, did he come in contact with somebody that had the sorcery type thing? Yeah, the Witch of Endor. The Witch of Endor? But was she possessed or was she just doing... I thought... She, did, did she... Is she the one that summoned... Um, Samuel. Samuel, thank you. Couldn't remember his name for a second. So she's the one that summoned Samuel. I'm not sure that shows possession so much as, uh, what would we call it? She's choosing to dally in those uh, dark things, right? She's choosing to operate in those things. Or, or she was a fraud, and that's why she was so surprised when it actually worked. Or she's a fraud and was surprised when it worked. That, that could be, or she could have just really, it, it, in a way, now, I mean, it's been a while since I read it, but it, it seemed like she was really scared when Samuel popped up. So, I mean, that was definitely... Where wouldn't you be? Oh, I would be scared if I saw anything like that. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> Does anybody have anything else on that before we move on? But that was that was a good question, and that's 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 how I look at it, and that's how I think about it. Is that helpful? Okay. I yes. Found, I found that thing in Revelation. I was struggling to think about. So it's Revelation chapter twenty, uh, and verse two, and he, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the abyss. So, so it's that whole question in Revelation of what's the thousand. A lot of different views in our culture about that, but if we take the view that Jesus is reigning now, as we know He is reigning in heaven, then uh, there's a sense in which He's cast the dragon, the, ser the serpent, in chains. And so, for a while there, before He came into reigning, we had this demon possession stuff, and now we don't. Right. So before, yeah, before. And, and I think of that, too, going back a little further, just thinking of where Jesus, you know, Satan was in front of God being the accuser. And we see in Revelation where Jesus goes up and basically Satan is kicked out, right? And Jesus is now our intercessor and defender in front of God. And this may go along with that, saying that, you know, here, uh, before the serpent was laid hold of, and this is like uh, Matt was saying, it's uh, Revelation 20, verse 2, before he was depowered and, and bound and for a thousand years, you know, before he was 
dethroned and depowered before Jesus defeated him, he, he could have had that power for demon possession and all that kind of thing. So, but, so our answer though, what this shows us is that Jesus, Jesus has that power over Satan, over demons, over all the powers of this world. All authority has been given to Jesus, right? So he has all authority. Now, all these things that Jesus did, are these things an example for us? And, uh, yes, well, Eddie? An example of what, God, what Jesus could do for right. him, what he could do and what he did do. Right. But we don't have the powers and he doesn't do those things today. Right. We we don't have that power, right? Yes, Pat? I just think of the Great Commission to be the apostles. Yes. Right. So we've been given the Great Commission, right? It's kind of a yes and no question, right? We have the Great Commission. We have what Jesus has told us to do, and we have his example of doing good. We don't have the miraculous power, and I don't want to ever want to present that incorrectly. We don't have that miraculous power. He still has that power. He can do whatever he wants, but we don't have that power. But still in the essence of what he was doing, helping people, bringing the gospel, that is what we should be doing. Yes, Kim? We have the avenue of prayer, which is very powerful in James chapter 5. So yes. If anyone in trouble or say, you know, who's going through something, we need to pray. So that is what we need to do. We certainly need to teach and share the gospel message. Um, and we need to pray for those who are suffering in whatever capacity that would be. Yes, we should be praying for people, right? We should be doing that. And that and that brings on the power of the Lord, but that's not our power. I, I can pray all I want and nothing's going to really happen unless the Lord does it. It doesn't matter, right, Judy? The wicked petition him who has the power. That's right. We can petition the one who has the power. We can go to the Lord and, and ask him. Uh, Matt? As you pointed out, Jesus preaching the gospel here and he has the power of miracles but kind of makes me think of Romans 1 16 where Paul says I am not ashamed of the gospel again for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Greek so that's that's really uh, the, the word of God is living and active and is able to do all these things today right the word of God is what is living and active for us and it does bring about salvation just like Paul was saying there in Romans um, so you know, we can, we can see where Jesus is, is doing these things for people, right? And it's, it's similar to like his parable in Matthew chapter 25. He encourages us to do well for other people, to do good for other people, right? The, the sheep and the goats parable. Um, we don't have his power, but the things that are within our power, the things that we can do, we should do. And uh, definitely prayer is one of those things. So notice that Jesus did not do miracles for himself. These were not selfish things he was doing. These were to point to the glory of God, to, to give praise to, the, to God, right? And this is also the practical side of the message of the gospel. And we see that stressed throughout places in the Bible, like Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. Um, and here, God is generally talking about the poor, for the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. And then Paul talking to the Ephesians in Acts 20, uh, verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, Jesus is is giving, right? He's not taking from these people. He's giving to them. He's giving something of value, of worth to them. The main thing being the gospel, like Matt was saying, that's the main thing, right? But two, we look at the practical side of the gospel. In James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't do you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, which, what does it profit? 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So Jesus was not just teaching these people who were suffering without doing what he could to help them. He was also helping them in other ways to relieve their suffering. And so I, I believe that he is our example in every way in that, in that sense, in those things. Yes. He said to love our enemies and to do good to those that persecute you. And if you go back to Proverbs 25, verse 1, it says, Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to those who hate you. Right. Proverbs 20, 25, verse 1. It, yeah, it does say to give your enemy bread if he's hungry. And, and that is an example there. He loved, he t teaches us to love our enemy, right? To do good even to our enemy. We'll, we'll see that as we go through the Gospels. So, question eight in our book. Where did the people come from who are, it says to follow Jesus, but who are, who are these people who are following Jesus or coming to Jesus at, at this time? Galilee, it says Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And so I have my map, and uh, let's see, Galilee is, of course, up and around this area, and you got Decapolis over there, and also all the way down into Judea and Jerusalem. People are coming, and, and of course, we know some of the Syrian people, too, are coming, right? And they're up there off the map, but... um. And beyond the Jordan, that's just that's just over on the right-hand side of the map when it says the Jordan is running between these two lakes. And so beyond the Jordan is off here and maybe even a little further off the map. But nonetheless, these people are coming from all over. So were all these people Jewish? No, right? They weren't all Jewish. So in that sense, when we look at what Jesus is doing, you know, do we do we only help fellow Christians? Do we only preach to fellow Christians? And no, right? I mean, we're supposed to remember who Jesus came to save, the the lost. He came for those who need a physician, the sick, right? So he's and he's drawing all these people to him. Paul says in Galatians six ten, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we have these priorities in our lives. We have God as our priority, our family, our spiritual family, and then we have our neighbor, those that are outside. And we have obligations to all these people as Christians. So now Jesus and his ministry became very famous. Does anybody remember who, the, who uh, we'll say who Mark blames for this fame? Okay, it's all right. He healed a leper. Jesus healed a leper in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark blames this leper really for this fame that Jesus got, right? Mark chapter 1, verse 45. Now, Jesus had healed this leper and he told him, hey, don't, don't be telling everybody. And I'm wildly paraphrasing, but he's like, keep it low. Don't, we don't need to announce this. But instead, here's what the leper does. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every direction. So just something I, I always think is kind of funny that Jesus, he had this, this fame at least, you know, for a, a time here. He had this fame where um, he couldn't enter the cities very well. And people had to come to him outside of the cities. Uh, also wants to notice how far these people traveled for them. Remember, no cars, nothing like that. These were days of travel. Some of them were bringing their sick and their invalid, and so it would be even a longer, harder journey for them. But they were doing that. And uh, just realize how much they desired the Lord to make those trips. How much they believed in him to do that. And we should desire the Lord like that. And we should want to be healed and made whole, though I'm thinking more of mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We should want that. I think those are really more important than physical healings. So before we move into chapter five, at this point we have both John the Baptist and Jesus have called people to repent. And I think that message still rings very true for us today. 
And so I want us to look at repentance for just a couple of minutes. I want us to think about these aspects of repentance. You know, what changes does our repentance bring about when we repent and turn to the Lord? For instance, who are we aligning ourselves with? How does our allegiance change when we repent and come to the Lord? Well, Christ is our king, right? We're changing our allegiance to Christ. Before, our I guess our allegiance was primarily for ourselves, usually. Um, so we are making him our king. We're submitting to his will. And we accept his authority and we work to do his will. Then we have a change of expectations. What do we expect if we live in Christ? Eternal life, salvation, right? That's suddenly we're not just expecting the drudgery of every day. We're just living this life until we die, right? People used to say, well, people still say life's hard, then you die. That's what you expected before. But now with Christ, your expectations should be changed, should be different, right? We no longer live as if this world and this life is all there is. There's much more. We expect eternity, eternal life with God. Or on the other hand, we know that there is also eternal punishment. And we want to make sure people are aware of that. We know that there's more than just what we see around us physically. <laughs> then we have a change of values, right? Who decides our moral values? We do? Where do we get our moral values from, though? God. We 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 do choose what we follow, right? That's that's true. But but if we're repenting and coming to God, then we're changing our values, our moral values, to align with God, right? To align with the Lord, Jesus Jesus. So, you know, we're changing our values to be in line with His. Now the only way we know to do that is from the Bible. We don't have any other source. Um, so that changes our values, though, is coming to the Lord, accepting him, and learning his values by looking at things such as the Sermon on the, on the Mount, which we're going to see in the next few chapters. And then we have a change of priorities. We were talking about priorities just a few minutes ago. You know, what do we spend our time on? What's important? And it's the things of God, right? That we change the focus of our lives. We change what we, how we live our life, right? How we spend our time and our resources. Yes. If we had made ourselves a boss and allegiance in the first point, and now it's God, then that right there shows that God's now priority, not myself. So I don't come from the same one. Right. Look at the word and figure out how I need to restructure. Right. When we change our allegiance, we're, we're taking, we're no longer the main focus of our life. It's no longer all about us. It's about the Lord. And we do want to restructure our life to be like, like the Lord, like we're following Jesus, right? It makes a big difference. It changes. It should change our life in all these ways. And then we have a change of mission, right? Before, our life was just all about ourselves, doing what we wanted, right? It was just a very selfish. So what is our mission and our goal now? Heaven? Heaven? Yes, ma'am. To make disciples. To make disciples, right? The Great Commission Pat mentioned earlier, that's, that's our, Jesus, his mission is now our mission. That's our mission. That's what it is. There is nothing, nothing before that. That is our mission and our goal to continue his ministry to help others come to know Jesus and, you know, as subjects, we should be subjects to him. He's a, he's the king. We should be living out <coughs> our lives under his law. And Jesus is going to give us a lot of the foundation here in the next chapters. Um, he's going to start here in chapter five with the Sermon on the Mount. And that, that uh, sermon is going to run through chapter seven, all the way through. It's going to be those three chapters, right? Does anybody have anything else, maybe for chapter 4, or anything that's come before, before we start in chapter 5? Yes, Rachel. Um, when you mentioned Mark 1, 
<clears throat> I jumped there with you and, and I backed up a little bit. And before he heals the leper, um, in verse 32 and 34, he's healing all of the, you know, they brought him all the sick and demon possessed. And Mark specifically says in verse 34, uh, he cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. I just thought that was really Oh, okay. So Mark chapter 1, verse 34, right? Uh, Rachel backed up some from where I was talking about earlier. And uh, Jesus, again, it mentions that Jesus was healing and uh, casting out demons. He says, and in verse uh, chapter 1 of Mark, verse 34, Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. They would have given him away, right? They would have. They would have said, "Well, we we see other places where the demons call out and say, hey, why are you messing with messing with us, Son of God?' You know, we don't. It's not our time yet, right? They knew their time was coming, but they didn't think it was their time yet. They didn't know how close they were, though. Yes. I've always wondered if Jesus' intention or plan was to go into those cities and teach in the synagogues, as was. Jesus still accomplished his miss mission, but it does sound like he couldn't go in and, and teach at some of those synagogues for a while because of that fame and this, this multitude of people who were following him. If you could imagine back then, a small town would be much smaller than what we think of now. And if thousands of people just came and run over your town, that would be, that would really be rough. That would be bad. So, so that would not be a good possibility. So if we look at chapter five, Matthew chapter five, and this is going to be, like I said, the next three chapters, really the, the Sermon on the Mount. And this chapter has the beginning of it. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is just very foundational teaching of Jesus. And the sermon starts in chapter 5 and ends with chapter 7. And if we look at, this is a, a much harder question than normal because it says, what are the main points of this chapter? And, and the, uh, the word book author gives a few. Uh, the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, salt and light, about us being salt and light verses 13 and 16 through 16. Um, Jesus and the law or Christ fulfills the law in verses 17 through 20. Now here we have a big lump, interpretations of the law versus kingdom righteousness. And this is verses 21 through 48, right? So that's actually a lot of subjects in that. There's a whole lot. And I'm going to break those down. We're going to talk about murder in verses 21 to 26, adultery, verses 27 to 30, marriage, verses 31 and 32, oaths, or maybe we'll say promises, but oaths, 33 through 37. Oh, actually, no, we're going to go with oaths. That's right, because they're swearing by. And then facing evil, verses 38 through 42, and loving your enemies or love even your enemies, Verses 43 through 48. So it's a lot of, a lot of different subjects, but they do go together. It is a whole message, a whole co cohesive message from the Lord. Now, before we get started, I would ask us to look at the end of the sermon, actually. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And Jesus says this at the end of the sermon. That's chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So I want to start with a couple of questions on this, because this really helps us to focus on this sermon. 
When he says what, you know, when he says these ser- these sayings of mine, what is he referring to? What are these sayings of the Lord? His teachings, man. All the stuff he said in that. All those chapters. The whole sermon, right? It's the whole sermon. He's saying this, <laughs> this is this is everything. You should be following all of this. Now, what do the foolish and the wise have in common? What do they have in common? They're building. They're oh well. They both have a. He's he's talking about they both are building a house, right? They both face storms and trials. They both face storms and trials, right? Okay. Anything else? Yes, the most important thing, the foundation that they built upon. Right, well, but their foundations are different, right? So I was talking about what they have in yeah, common. The foundations, that, that was a difference in their thing. They both built, but it was a different foundation. Right, they had different foundations. That was their problem. So the the thing they have in common, though, if you know, did you have something, Jane? I was going to say, from, from these verses, these two different groups have both heard the word. One is that. Right. Right. That's that's what they that's one of the main things they have in common here. They both hear and understand. The Greek word there means they listen and understand. They actually understand. It's not like they hear it and they don't understand. They actually understand it. Listen and understand. They understand what he's saying. So then you look at what separates them, and we talked about some of that, right? What separates the wise from the foolish? The foundation, right? Well, what does Jesus say in those verses separates them? The wise do them, right? The wise do them. So the idea here as we study that we realize we want to realize that we are responsible to not just hear and understand, but to actually do and act upon these things that Jesus is teaching. And I wanted to bring that to the front because for me, that made me, I remember originally when I read that, that made me go back and reread the whole thing again. Because I was like, oh, I'm supposed to actually, I'm responsible for all this. Yes. So they both have heard and understand. They both heard and understood. And then they made choices. And, and then they made choices about what they were going to do, right? And some of them chose not to do it. One was wise and one, and one was wise and one was not, and the wise do those. They follow. They follow the Lord, right? So, if we look at this as a foundation, like like Addie was saying, this this is a foundation. This is a picture of a foundation, right? And this sermon is a good starting point for Christians. It's a good place. For young Christians, it's also a great reminder for us older folks and older Christians to check our foundation, to look at our foundation and see how we're doing, right? We want to make sure that we're founded in Jesus and his teachings. And we want to notice that, you know, this foundation has some problems here. And if you'll, if you'll look, it's, it's kind of crumbling and falling apart there. It's got this crack leading up there. It looks like something has snuck in over here. Maybe some, some creature or something. I don't know. But there's problems. There's problems that need to be fixed, that need to be repaired, right? This, but this one is breaking down. So we need to think about, have we maintained our foundation? Are we maintaining it? Do we have cracks in our faith? Have we allowed the world to slip in on us? It's easy to do, and I'm sure I've been guilty of it at times, and I, I'm sure it happens to all of us. So we're going to start with, in chapter 5 here, we're going to start with the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are very important, but they can also <coughs> challenge us, right? Because the Beatitudes are special attitudes, special thi- special attitudes that we should have in our hearts. They're all about our hearts. Um, they show how true happiness comes from living a, a God-centered life and not a, a me or man-centered life, right? These, these are all things that are important and should be about our heart. The, the word for blessed used in, the, used in these Beatitudes, um, it means happy and fortunate. And this is the joy of having God's favor, of following Him and doing, doing right, doing correctly. 
So unfortunately, though, I think we are out of time for this morning. So I'm going to stop there and we'll come back next week and we'll start with the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Thank you so much for your time and your attention.